have another equally impressive guest. Uh, Julie Guy has been your morning wake-up call for almost two decades, but started her career at Heritage Rock Station WSHE. She's only rock and roll. <laughs> Back in 1991. Since then, Julie has literally been all over your cell phone or radio dial. She's had stints at Planet Radio, 949 Zeta. She used to be called Zeta 4, I believe. I'm not sure my age. Big, Big 105.9, and then landed on 97.3 The Coast, where those two girls in the morning was born. Those two girls, including Sarah G, are back. Can be heard weekday mornings from 5 to 10 on 101 Light FM. Please give them both a warm welcome. I'm Julie Guy. This is my co-host, Tamara G. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for making up with us. Thank you for being here. And if we are your alarm clock, we're very sorry about that. Um, I am honored to really be here again. This is my second time that I'm uh, part of this dynamic duo of Cindy and Sabrina that I'm sure all of you know very, very well. And very, very exciting, obviously, to be here for the big debut of Experts in Pink. Everybody's either going to buy a copy of or go home with it today, right? I feel like we're on Ellen. Everyone's going home with one today. Um, you know, they had huge success, as you know, with the first two books, and this one I know is going to also be a big success. Really, this book just opens your eyes to so many wonderful, different... It's a, it's a journey, and it kind of goes... You go through the journey with them and the book, and that's what they both have done inside these pages. So I'm grateful to be here today to help get us to talk to all these wonderful, accomplished people because it's about the people in your life that help navigate you through this journey. We're all in this together. Uh, we're going to begin with Dr. Ironson, a professor of health psychology and a board-certified psychiatrist. Over 250 publications in the field of behavioral medicine applied to HIV and AIDS, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. Currently, the president of the health division of the International Positive Psychology Association. Uh, her current areas of focus include examining positive psychological factors, spirituality, compassion, uh, optimism, and all of that which we all need so very much in everyday life. So please welcome Dr. Ironson. Welcome everybody. Um, this is an amazing project that Cindy and Sabrina have put together. I first met Cindy many, many years ago when she was an administrative assistant in the psychology department. And she had this bubbly personality, which she still has, of course. <laughs> and she made everybody feel comfortable. The faculty, the clients, everybody. And then, when she got breast cancer, she decided that she wanted to help everybody again. <laughs> and of course, how do you do that? Now imagine that, unfortunately, if you get a diagnosis of breast cancer, how terrifying that is, and all the things you need to deal with, all the questions you have. How is the diagnosis made? Um, and there's a wonderful, so this book answers all the questions, so I want to start with basically mentioning what the major content areas are. Okay, so the first one is how is the diagnosis made? And, you know, when you go in for a mammogram, you, you want a sense of, well, what do they look for? And what are the imaging techniques? And why do they do, for example, a 3D? Um, and how about ultrasound? So that question is answered in a great chapter by uh, Dr. Yepes, who's on the panel. And then, after the diagnosis, you have the questions of, well, what kind of treatment am I going to get? Surgery? Am I going to get um, chemotherapy? Am I going to get radiation? And what are all the issues and questions I need to ask around those? For example, side effects and how to deal with them. Side effects of chemotherapy and how to deal with them. So there are chapters on that. Then you have a decision about, well, if you have surgery, uh, what, what are your choices on breast reconstruction? Um, do you do uh, autologous breast reconstruction? Uh, what type of breast reconstruction do you have? So there are, there are actually a couple of chapters on that and then getting nipple tattoo. So this book actually covers everything. The next topics are issues associated with the treatment and how to deal with those. So lymphedema is one of them. Another one is neuropathy. And another one is pain. And there are lots of suggestions for ameliorating uh, those symptoms. What do you do? Then there are interesting chapters on uh, the impact on dental health. There's a big impact of some of these treatments on dental health and cardiac complications. So everything is covered. Of course, the next issue is, aside from the medical treatment, you have 
all the psychological issues you need to deal with, including things like fear of recurrence and um, you know how do I view my life now? Uh, how do I rearrange my priorities? And so one of the chapters is by Dr. Simi Kumar. He was actually a student at the University of Miami in our doctoral program. And he's so good, I ask him to give a lecture every year in my graduate course. And so I've actually kept in touch with him. Uh, there's a great chapter on yoga and meditation by Tamara Anderson and Heather, who is here. Um, and um, this book also doesn't forget about the caregiver. It's really, there are many challenges about being a caregiver. So there's a chapter on that. Okay, next section is on healthy lifestyles. <clears throat> and what are the things that we think of with healthy lifestyles? Well, one of them is nutrition, and Sabrina has written a terrific chapter on nutrition. Then we have obesity, how to deal with that, and what options are available, including surgery. And, of course, exercise, and how to exercise safely. I mean, everybody wants to exercise, but after you've had breast cancer surgery, what, do you, what, what accommodations do you need to make? And, by the way, since I'm a psychiatrist, I have to throw this little one in. Exercise is the equivalent of taking an antidepressant for mild to moderate depression. Yes, it's actually been shown in head-to-head -head trials against antidepressants. So for those of you who don't want to take an antidepressant and you're feeling sad or you've been diagnosed with depression, exercise. And if you see me later, I'll give you the specific prescription for that. <laughs> okay, now... The next section is on personal stories. And as I mentioned, Cindy shares her personal story, as she did in the previous editions. And it beautifully leads you through adjustments that you have to make. Uh, there's also a, a story, uh, another woman's story, who um, one of the things that she does to help her through this is she joins the heroine's choir. So she finds that music is very helpful. Now, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there are several chapters on difficult issues. And I, I think hats off to Cindy and Sabrina for including these. It's more on sex and sexuality, right? So this is something that, you know, people have to deal with, but you don't want to talk about it. So she hits it head on. Um, she talks about palliative care. Um, and there's also a chapter on male breast cancer. And that's really important, too, because, you know, men who get breast cancer, who do you talk to, right? So um, it's really great. And there's a legal chapter as well. Uh, so to conclude, getting a diagnosis of breast cancer can be daunting and overwhelming. And this book really takes uh, that to, to, to a stage where you can deal with it a lot better because you know uh, what you're going to be going through, how to deal best with it, what questions to ask, and how to get the best treatment and care. So hats off to Cindy and Sabrina. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to introduce now one of the authors, one of the dynamic duo from Experts in Pain, Cindy Papali Hammontree. What can we say about Cindy? <laughs> so she joined the team at the Miami Breast Center in 2010. She retired working at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center at UM for about 27 years. Um, and she helped so many people, you know, go through the whole breast cancer journey. And then she was diagnosed in 2000 with stage one, multifocal invasive breast cancer, had a bilateral mastectomy, and I guess was inspired and said, you know what, I need to educate people because she knew what it was that she needed when she was going through this. So this is the third book, the third incarnation. She's appeared on Channel 6. She's collaborating. She's going to be in a movie. So we'll, we'll say we knew her when. She's collaborating with Derek Gregg, who's a Peabody Award winning producer. And I think we all know how relentless and passionate Cindy really is. So without any further ado, Miss Papali Hanantri. Well, I guess we should introduce the other lady that's coming up here, too. All right, Sabrina Hernandez She's coming up later. is a registered dietitian, nutrition counselor, and certified diabetes educator who graduated from Florida International University. Any FIU graduates in the house today? She has a degree in dietetics and nutrition and trained at Cleveland Clinic Hospital and Palm Springs Hospital. She also has received the Miami Herald Silver Knight Award for dedication in community service and has completed mission assignments in Africa, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico City, focusing on alleviating child malnutrition and hunger. Just so y'all knew I could talk too. So, thanks to Jen and Sabrina. Thank 
you everyone. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, I'm very happy everyone is here. Uh, I was very scared that nobody would come. I had visions of talking to nobody. But I know you all got my emails. I want to thank you so much for your patience. I know that you've got a thousand emails. No, not a thousand. Maybe about a thousand more. But I, I am just so organized. I guess it comes from a dad who's in the military that's very strict. Uh, but thank you all for being here. Um, my journey began, as uh, Julie Guy mentioned, in July of 2000, when I was hearing those words for the first time, your biopsy is positive for breast cancer. I know that many of you here that are survivors can relate to what I'm talking about. It is scary. It is petrifying. Uh, a lot of things go running through your mind. Uh, for me, since I worked for a professor uh, at the uh, Psychological Services Center at the UM, uh, my first thought wasn't... Um, how bad is my cancer? My first thought is, am I going to die? So I just started all these things going through my mind, but I learned a lot meeting a lot of other people diagnosed with breast cancer. At first, I didn't want to talk to anyone. I was embarrassed. I had no breasts. And let me tell you, having breasts for no five years was no fun. Uh, I was afraid to even put an implant in because of the fact they said, you, you know, for the first five years you could get a recurrence. So I started thinking of all these things. It was very difficult to buy clothes. Uh, some of you might already know about the prosthetics that they have. They're very uncomfortable. So going through all of that just was very daunting to me. Um, skipping ahead 18 years now. I'm an 18-year survivor. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm still trying to learn about meditation and yoga. I'm reading oh, tomorrow's right. chapters because I'm an A personality, so I can't, you know, meditate. But I'm trying. Uh, the chapter is amazing. Thank you, Tamara, wherever you are. Uh, that chapter Tamara. is Tamara. 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 It's her name. Tamara. You have the same Tamara. name. You've already met. Oh, my God. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry for butchering your name, but you know that I love you. Um, and she, it, the chapter is amazing. I cannot tell you. It was very easy to read and understand because sometimes you'll go and you'll read something you won't understand it. But thank you again. So I've learned to do that. And then along the way, I've met amazing other survivors. Um, I particularly want to mention tonight the Link of Hope sisters who have been the most amazing. I know we have some here this evening. Uh, founder Patricia Thank you so much. Uh, quick story about how me and Pat met. I'm very persistent with meeting people. Some of you might know that already. Uh, I wanted to meet Pat. I was in a fashion show and I ran into Pat when I was getting ready to go on the runway and she told me just do it. Just go out there and do it. Who cares? The people out there love you. But long and behold, she wound up being my maid of honor, so we are very good friends. So that's how persistent I am. <laughs> But the Link of Hope sisters uh, are women from around the world who have gone through or going through breast or other types of cancers. Link of Hope sister mission, they are cancer survivors helping the newly diagnosed by sharing her own personal stories, their own personal stories and what has helped them. We hope to ease and empower, educate, inspire women who are just beginning their own dance with cancer. Um, our support is patient to patient and personal. We are actually, if you go on Facebook, Positively Pat is there, and the Link of Hope Sister group is there as well. Uh, anyone that really doesn't want to talk to anyone in person, they can actually go on there and actually send private messages if they have any fears or concerns. The other group, and this touches my heart dearly because we've lost two members already to that group, um, I'm sorry if I get a little emotional because this is really, it's called the Younger Brave Beauties Y2B2, founded by Jen Hernandez, Suni Smith, and Janelle Rodriguez in 2015 as an online support community for younger women ages 18 through 40 diagnosed with breast cancer. Rather than only meet in person, the online group provides young women a platform to connect much quicker at any time of day or night, and we all know that we sometimes get up in the middle of the night, with others who truly understand. Sadly, both Janelle and Sunni died of metastatic breast cancer in 2016. Jen 
asked Dana Coleman to be the group's vice president, and together they filed paperwork in 2018 to become a nonprofit. Rather than exclude women with other types of cancers, Y2B2 expanded to include young women fighting all cancers, and an inclusive change to provide resources, outreach, and community to an age group widely lacking in support. And God, are they lacking. In addition to the online community, Y2B2 members regularly support each other at doctor's appointments, with family emergencies, and meet through gatherings in person. Additionally, Y2B2's goal is to ultimately have a small phone app to reach young women fighting cancers across the country and around the globe. I really like that because as you know, social networking is really, really powerful. Y2B2 offers emotional support, encourage impromptu members meet up for scans, appointments, and even picnics, and is also developing a scholarship fund for deserving members with metastatic breast cancer. Uh, Y2 also supports Metaviver, metastatic breast cancer awareness, research, and support. An organization that sends 100%, and this is no lie, 100% of donations to stage four metastatic breast cancer research. If you'd like to connect with them, you can go to info at y2b2.org or you can even visit www.y2b2.org. And at this time, I'd like the Y2B2 members to stand up and also Jennifer Hernandez, where are you? Some of you have heard this story before, but it's always left for me to say the story of how Cindy and I met. Um, we were at Dan Marino's, um, and I was um, very excited talking about nutrition, as I usually am very passionate about um, the subject. And Cindy overheard from the table behind. <laughs> so she waited until I, there was ballet, I remember, and I had my ticket, and I was waiting for my car. And Cindy comes running and says to me, hi. <laughs> uh, I heard you saying something about nutrition and how much you love broccoli and how much you love all, all the stuff that I had said. And I'm like, wow, she is really, was really overhearing my conversation. <laughs> I'm like, so I, I need to give her at least five minutes <laughs> thinking, OK, I'm going to run the other direction. <laughs> but incidentally, Cindy turned out to be what I call my pink angel because the last thing I knew or ever imagined is without any risk factors and without anybody else in my family, um, grandmother or anyone ever being diagnosed, my mother would be diagnosed with a really aggressive form of cancer a few days later. So Cindy um, was the person that I, she, she said, listen, I don't know how, but I'm, I'm writing this book and I want you to be involved and um, I just want you to be part of it and talk about broccoli and all kinds of things. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. I've never, you know, I've never written, you know, I, I don't consider myself, you know, I, I just couldn't imagine myself in that, in those shoes. But Cindy says, I know you can. And a few days later, I had to call her up and say, Cindy, I, my mother was diagnosed. And although I'm in the science world, although I know doctors, I'm actually married to one, I don't know anything about breast cancer and my mom surviving this. I need help. And she said, that's why you're going to be my co-author. <laughs> and so the, this is the third edition. The first edition was in, two, in 2006. Um, and I am so blessed and so happy. Today is the biggest celebration. I have to tell you, today is the happiest day of my life. I was telling Julie, my mother, mommy, parate por favor. <laughs> Mama. Later, my mom Amazing. is alive. And just like you see in tears here, that's the way that I wrote my chapter. And that's the way that we would visit uh, the doctors that contributed to the book in 2006. Me in full on, you know, tears. And how is my mom going to stay alive during this process? 
And I realized, you know, Sabrina, you gotta get tough. You gotta, you gotta be there for other women who feel like you. Getting a, a diagnosis for breast cancer is the scariest thing that can ever happen. Getting a diagnosis for the caregiver, like the daughter who adores her mother, who is everything in her life, is just <coughs> devastating. <coughs> so, my angel, oh, thank you. and um, and my sur and, and and surviving, surviving. I think I, I would take my mom to every single chemo, every single radiation, and I would end up with all those symptoms. I ended up very sick <laughs> because of it. Um, as a healthcare professional, I had to get therapy for it, um, and therefore we have included a lot of therapy in the book. And incidentally, everything, every step of the way, and that's why we've done three, th three editions, because as we go, you know, growing and understanding and learning and sharing, we go to places to talk about breast cancer to women who are so scared, to women who really need listen you're going to be okay we're going to be right there you know with you or the or the families you know the mothers the sisters the husbands the brothers and so along the way we realized yoga therapy works music therapy works my mother actually and this is this is coming to the third book my mother says to me one day sabrina where where the chemotherapy really affected me <coughs> where you you've never touched you know upon is my teeth, my teeth are destroyed. And of course, since I'm always praying for angels to come our way, Rita, please stand up. Dr. Rita Jardo. <laughs> Contributed an amazing chapter amazing. about dental care. I've, I've translated it to my mother in Spanish and she actually thanked me. So I am so grateful to your chapter. It is absolutely outstanding. Thank you. So that's why we have three books. And I, and I think as long as we're, you know, a, a duo and, and, and we're, you know, alive, we're going to have books as we go along because it's just it just has to grow. The education and the information that we offer women who get diagnosed has to grow. So if any of you have any thoughts of what else we can add that we forgot, <laughs> throw it on. Although we, we will be, we will be uh, having this book in Spanish by popular demand. We just got asked to go to Rome in 2018, so it will be in Italian, although we're going to have to start taking lessons of Italian. Yes, Julie, I'll help you. I'll go with you. Okay, I'll translate. Because it's, it's getting recognition in the way that people are connecting with us and saying, thank you, I did not know that. You have true experts that have written their chapter, their, their profession, their passion, their expertise, and now I know. So that's the purpose for, for our, our journey of love. And uh, we are so grateful to every single contributor in this book, to every survivor, to everybody who has supported us. It's not easy putting together a book. It's very it's, challenging. It's very challenging. Um, and, and actually, it's very emotional, too. Uh, because it's a subject that's so dear to our heart. Um, my chapter on nutrition, I, I, I got a, just such a blessing and such an opportunity to really write about prevention, which I love so much. So um, I invite you to, to read about broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell I've got, I've got to say this, um, ju just like, you know, Dr. Gale, you know, just like there is the latest uh, science information on doing 30 minutes of exercise and actually helping you know the depression the anxiety there is actual clinical research that shows I mean we've got nowadays under the microscope that broccoli and that pendant <coughs> wild blueberries 26 um, antioxidants the wild ones uh, the wild ones you know we did not have this information a hundred years ago we were just worried about vitamin C and just understanding its function now we know so um, you know I, I always talk about broccoli but now I can scientifically back it up and say you know what mix it in with whatever your favorite food is make it disappear there's there's actually um, 
uh, my husband's recipe actually is broccolini a la Houdini. I ate broccoli. <laughs> I ate broccoli and I didn't even know it. And one day I'm like, what is this? I love this. This is so tasty. And he's like, you have no idea, but it's a whole blender of broccoli, carrots, garlic, and pine nuts. So I was like, wow, this is amazing. So the, the actual recipe is in here. So I invite you to, to read my chapter of nutrition. And then we, we must say, um, uh, that we love you, first of all. Where is she? Linda Burroughs, where are you? Yes. Yes. Linda. <laughs> Linda's amazing. Wherever she goes, she's touching the life of someone who needs help. Even when she was walking in, Someone asked her, are you a survivor? Because she's so beautifully dressed in pink. <laughs> and and was able to share the story with that young, very scared person that she saw that said, my family member just got diagnosed. And so they bonded. And so a little bit about um, Linda. In October of 1997, five months after her diagnosis of breast cancer at the age of 49, Linda Burroughs founded Your Bossom Buddies. Bosom. Bosom, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Time that, to share. So thank you so much. And for all the survivors that you helped so much, Linda, really thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, have to, we have to give a shout out to Tracy and um, a little short bio on Tracy. Like many women, and this I quote, <laughs> I have a long family history of breast and ovarian cancer. Nervous about my own chances of developing the disease, I underwent testing for the BRCA gene mutation in my early 20s, and I learned, I learned I was a carrier for the BRAC2 gene mutation. Every six months, I had an MRI and or ultrasound mammogram. The amount of stress these tests put on me was very heavy. I could not wait to have my family and have a hysterectomy and a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy. The choice was not easy to remove healthy body parts. Surgeries are very difficult, and they do not take. And sorry, I get so emotional. Oh. Story. That's oh. why we, we were we were like, who's gonna go? Who's gonna do it? Yeah. So, um, I think you should end it. I think you should end it. Yeah. Tell us. From my own experience, I decided to go ahead and start after I came out to talk about it to Braca Strong, which now three years later is a local nonprofit. We support, we educate, we inspire, and we empower women throughout their journeys to eliminate the feeling of isolation. Since I was so young, I encouraged genetic testing and how to make a woman feel whole again. Braca Strong strives to alleviate the emotional and financial burdens of women facing genetic predisposed breast or ovarian cancer through advocacy, direct assistance, empowerment, fundraising, and events. Thank you so much for that. All right, so now we're going to get a little bit of an introduction from each of our panelists, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A, because we know that you all definitely want to uh, ask some of the panelists some questions. So we'll start, and obviously they've written in the book, and we would yes. want to uh, have them speak a little bit about their chapter. We're going to try to limit it to about two to three minutes each, if we can, please, so that we can get to the Q&As. Who do we want to start with? We have it in order. Oh. That's quite all right. We are going to go right now with Dr. Kesmodel. All right, Dr. Kesmodel. Hey. Hey, how are you? Looking pretty in pink, all right. <laughs> Dr. Kesmodel. model is a surgical oncologist and board certified surgeon who specializes in the treatment of benign and malignant breast diseases and high risk skin malignancies, including melanoma. A lot of big words there. <laughs> She's an associate professor of surgery in the Division of Surgical Oncology in, at the University of Miami Health Center. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And um, this is working, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Apparently, um, I someone else turned it on. Um, I'd really like to thank Cindy and Sabrina for asking me to participate in this project. I uh, have only been in Miami for about a year and a half, and I met Cindy at a Medivivor event last October at Bloomingdale's, and uh, then she asked me to participate in the book, so I'm really, really grateful that she asked me to write a chapter. I'm, I'm a surgeon, and uh, briefly, when, when patients come to see me, I'm probably the second person who talks to them after that diagnosis. So maybe the radiologist calls, and then they come to see me. 
And uh, there's a lot of fear and emotion that comes with that initial visit because, first of all, uh, just, they've just been diagnosed with cancer, men and women, and everyone's very concerned about whether they're going to die from the disease. So that is the, the fear. And then I'm telling them that I'm going to start cutting. And so there's, there's a, a lot that comes in that visit. And usually it's about an hour, hour and a half that I spend with uh, patients. But clearly, there's only so much information that you can give in an hour or an hour and a half. And it's a lot of information. So when I wrote the chapter, what I was trying to do was really give a short, comprehensive guide for patients and their families to have them understand what the options are for breast cancer surgery, how we counsel patients on what type of surgery that they're candidates for. Um, as you all know, Angelina Jolie had a bilateral mastectomy because she had a BRCA1 mutation. Would you mind standing up because we cannot oh. see you. We're all short. Okay. We're short and we're short. <laughs> <laughs> So, so after Angelina Jolie had that surgery, I had every patient calling me, telling me they wanted a bilateral mastectomy, but they didn't understand why she had that surgery. And for example, Christina Applegate also has a BRCA1 mutation. So what's right for one patient is not right for another patient. We have to individu individualize the treatment approach for each patient. So I try and understand where the patient's coming from, what stage of cancer they have, what their options are, and then we basically sit down and kind of review what I think would be the best treatment plan. But I always take into uh, consideration what the patient wants as well. Um, so that's what I was trying to uh, write in my chapter. I also added some new techniques that we're doing for more cosmetically favorable mastectomies, oncoplastic surgery, so newer techniques where sometimes we can preserve the breast in patients who want breast preservation, or if we need to do a mastectomy, we can uh, try and preserve cosmesis. So right now, it's my pleasure to bring up a, a very good friend of both Tamara G and myself. We met Dr. Carmen Kalfa a few years ago. We had her on our show, and we keep asking her back, and she keeps showing up, which is fantastic. Uh, triple board certified breast medical oncologist. She's been recognized for her clinical care and research at the University of uh, Miami Miller School of Medicine. What's great about her is that she works with underserved women in the Tri-County area using unique strategies to increase screening and early detection. We know that that's key. Uh, widely published, including in Experts in Pink, so please welcome Dr. Kalfa. Hey, hi everybody. Thank hi, you hi. so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Cindy and Sabrina and Julie and everybody in the panel and all the survivors and the caregivers and everybody that, uh, that is here tonight with us. Of course, I'm super happy to meet uh, that I met uh, Cindy and she hasn't read the book uh, chapter with her. And uh, it's about breast medical oncology. So I'm a breast medical oncologist. And I can tell you that everything you heard tonight is part of that initial conversation that comes in that first diagnosis visit. And it's overwhelming. And the patient comes, see, they see Dr. Kiswani first, or they see the medical oncology first. Um, but they'll get, they'll get to me soon and don't have a lot of questions. They already looked it up, they already Googled, they're already in, in fear and frightened, and they already talked to friends, and they already know that some of their friends have not made it. So it's a very emotional disease, and uh, it just uh, affects a woman in so many ways, and affecting that woman who's the center of, of family somewhere, uh, it's just affecting, it's affecting everybody. It's affecting the kid, it's affecting the mom, it's affecting the workplace, it's affecting their friends, and then she feels responsible for all the things that come with. And if that woman hasn't had her family, it's even more dramatic. It happened at any age, as you know, it's a disease of 61, but what will happen is happening at younger ages uh, for many, many reasons. So we see women that haven't had their families that have or they don't have a BRCA gene mutation or several other genes. They haven't had children, and now we talk about chemotherapy, surgery, removing, you know, breast removing ovaries, doing these treatments now for anywhere from five years to 10 years, and just having to, to think about is breast cancer for the remaining of the lives. So 
we become partners in this. So we, it's a journey that we embark on. And uh, the first thing I try to do is to really make them feel like they have a partner in me. And not every treatment is right for every patient. And some of them are gonna want chemo, some of them are not gonna want chemo. What we know and was published recently is that if they really do go with the chemotherapy, they have a much better chance of having the best outcome. And even though women are going out there trying to get you know, complementary treatments, uh, we also know that actually that can be detrimental. And it's a 200-fold increase in dying if you're not receiving the traditional treatment. So what this book brings together, and Sabrina and Cindy and all the authors have done a beautiful job in doing it, it's really bringing all the knowledge to the patient and the caregiver in their hands in a way that gives you the knowledge that you need to get going and also gives you the confidence that treatments are not what they used to be, that we do chemo and women do rock chemo. I'm coming from the field where uh, the kids were playing and uh, I had the survivor with me on the stage who were actually there tossing the coin. She is getting chemo, she shaved her head, she was there with me, and in the middle of the chemo cycle, she was on the field doing this. And that's why the, the chemo has become. It's no longer the thing that people are dying from. It's just something that saves people's lives. So it's a lot It's a lot that comes, but I want to say that it does take a village, that all, this, all the things that you find from the book, the nutrition, I mean, I wish I had every one of you with me every day, every one for every patient I've seen. <laughs> Because that's how much I need, from the diagnosis to the recovery, to the survivorship, to their lifetime, to their exercise, to their heart flushes. It does take a village to, to get them through. And I'm really blessed to be part of this community, and I thank you so much for having us today. Our next doctor in the house is Dr. Beatrice Amendola. She's a highly respected radiation oncologist and an honored member of the leading medical society. She's been a highly successful practicing physician of radiation oncology in the U.S. for more than 35 years. Her main areas of interest include breast, lung, head, neck, and prostate cancer, as well as brain tumors. Dr. Beatrice, on the Thank you very much, Cindy and Sabrina, and all of you to participate in this participation in this, in this meeting. As a radiation oncologist, I will second all the authors today. Education is the most important part of the diagnosis. Once you are diagnosed with breast cancer, you must be educated. You need to understand all the modalities of treatment. And what happened with cancer is there are three pillars. One pillar is surgery. The second pillar is medical oncology, and the third radiation oncology. Another important aspect is patients sometimes get in a rush. They go and they want to have or surgery or whatever method there is, but they don't want to have anything done because they don't want to have anything bad in your body. But it's not like that. You need to discuss with your doctor. It's not an emergency. Breast cancer is not an emergency. You have to research. You need to go and see the surgeon the medical oncology, the radiation oncologist, and then make the decision that is best for you. Uh, sometimes publicity, and you all know, like you mentioned before, not every patient is a BRCA positive. The numbers are between 5 and 10%. So there is a 90% of patients that will be diagnosed with their cancer and can be cured with conservative treatment. As a radiation oncologist, I would like to tell you that radiation has changed over the years Remarkably, people are afraid to get burned, but the new techniques that we have now, we can look at the breast uh, breathing, you know, synchronization. We know exactly where we can hit the tumor or the breast. The patient will have a lumpectomy with three dental breasts and we know how to do it. There are many ways that radiation oncology can help you. The same way the medical oncologists and surgeons, we can talk to you. We spend time with the patients. We try to, many times the surgeons ask me, can you see this patient and tell me what, what should we do and help her to, because you will spend sometimes more time, you know, with the patients than you know, somebody is busy. So we do that in our practice. Uh, the other thing that is important is you don't have to be afraid because now with the technology, with the systemic therapy, majority of patients, stage one, they're cured practically in 100% of the cases. In stage two, 92% of the cases. And more advanced can still be cured. 
we, you know, we're not doing radiation only in one part of the body. If the patient has a relapse, we can treat. You know, Dr. Badia, an orthopedic surgeon, can tell you we can do so many things uh, that we can help. We can, you know, an example, a patient developed a metastasis in the brain. We can treat that patient and those patients can live useful life with cognitive uh, function for many, many years. So I think it's very important education, like everybody said, education is number one. And this book is great because we have nutrition, we have exercise. Imagine all those things that you know we couldn't afford, we didn't have anything like that in the past. So I think it's important that education number one. And I thank you, Cynthia, Sabrina, and all of you for this. Thank you. so much this evening and I'm also learning the biggest thing is that uh, fear is what is the number one uh, is the number one emotion that comes out of this and without fear is because we don't have enough knowledge and I'm assuming all the knowledge you need is here and here in this book so I'm already sold I'm buying the first book uh, Dr. Calva is next he completed his training at the uh, prestigious Hop John Ho Johns Hopkins University of Maryland Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Program Reconstruction, uh, conducted award-winning research on cancer biology. He's ready to go. Dr. Calva. Hi guys. Yes, maybe I'll just, I'll just use this one to make it easy. So I'm I'm sort of the the uh, the guy that comes in and, and tries to give you some ease, right? You go <coughs> through a journey because the breast cancer diagnosis is not just here it is. It is years to come. It's a journey that you're going through. And you're talking to so many people, and at, at times you sort of get this tunnel vision effect, right? You're, you don't know what else is out there. There's so many, so much data about how you can get your breast reconstructed. And actually, when I was at Hopkins, we were doing five or six deep flaps a day, whereas that's basically where you take fat from your abdomen, you make a little hole in your ribs, and you plug them into the vessels coming right underneath those ribs pretty dramatic <coughs> procedure. It's sort of become a lot of the standard of care in terms of reconstructing your breast with your own tissues. Uh, implants is a great uh, venue, but if you have radiation, sometimes you can have some trouble, you can have, have some contractions. If the skin is really tight and you can really deform your breast with infections. So when I was doing all of these procedures, I was thinking to myself, every single time you were there till 10, 11 o'clock at night, there's got to be a better way. And so when I, graduated, I looked around and I found Dr. Corey and his method of reconstructing breasts, which is using liposuction techniques. So women love liposuction. <laughs> and why not use those techniques to basically reconstruct your breasts and you don't have to rotate flaps of fat. You don't have to make holes in the ribs. You can basically use the exact same fat of your abdomen or your back by harvesting it and then grafting it really gently. You're putting seeds in a fertile uh, field so that those fat cells can get blood flow and they can survive. Now it's it's not you know it's not magic. We're not Harry Potter's. It's not going to be in one procedure I'm going to inject and you're going to be done. It, this this takes process. It's three four operations. They're all outpatient, minimal discomfort because you're not really cutting, you're basically grafting. So patients tolerate it well, and over three or four operations, basically we can regrow your breasts, you can reconstruct your breasts without damaging the abdominal wall, without moving muscles and making you weak on one side. Basically, we're not stealing from Peter to pay Paul, we're leaving Peter alone, and we're making <laughs> Paul bigger. <laughs> I would love to try the uh, broccolini a la Houdini. <laughs> it might be that, it's that, is it that amazing that it disappears? <laughs> you don't hear some of your plates. Yeah. I, want, I really want to thank you guys because, uh, you know, I work with uh, Cindy at the Miami Press Center and uh, 
Her energy is, um, it's, it, it sort of goes beyond the walls. And so it's amazing that you were able to, to you guys put this book together because it's the A to Z in terms of knowledge. Once you get that diagnosis, it's as we're saying, you get fear, and that fear can go away by you becoming more and more aware of what's next, what's going to happen, and how can I deal with it if there are complications or there are issues. You're looking for doctors that are going to embrace you and embrace the journey, not just that particular moment in time. You want somebody that's going to be there and continue to be there. Right. All right? Vascular Institute, Baptist Health South. He also is a clinical associate professor of medicine at Florida International University. He has been published extensively and participated in multiple national and international clinical trials. He's board certified in internal medicine, cardiology, interventional cardiology, nuclear cardiology, echocardiology, and advanced heart failure and cardiac transplantation. In other words, he's a very smart dude. All right. <laughs> Everybody knew how great he was because he is in fact Cindy's cardiologist. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everybody he's really great and a very smart dude. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It's a very humbling experience to be here. Oh, please. Yes. It is a very humbling experience to be here. And there's a reason. We, we are now, we live in this virtual world, right, where, where we never talk to each other. And to build your energy, to have this really, this reader that wants to be here, that wants to know about this book, is very humbling for us. It's also great to have these this authors here, because all of us, I think we're passionate about this, about what we do. And, and we are here to tell you, to share with you what we know. This book is special in the sense that fear, you mentioned that before, is what drives and uh, the anxiety of not knowing, right? This book is going to help you empower you as a patient and to make good decisions because when you get the, you get diagnosed with any disease, first thing you go, you go to the internet, you try to figure out what's going on, and you have no idea. And the only thing it does is just increases your fear. And this book is to help you with that, to tell you that there's hope, that there's treatment, that there's decisions that you need to make and that you're gonna survive. <coughs> and this is the key of, of, of cancer today. Cancer is great because in the sense that even you get diagnosed, the, med, the, the treatments of modern medicine increases the survival. It increases the survival dramatically. There's most kids, even kids that get diagnosed with cancer, most of them are in rich adulthood. And that's, that's wonderful. So there's hope in this, and you're here because of that. Now, medications that we use, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, they're great, but sometimes in the journey, things happen. And in my case, cardiologist, 50% of the patients that are treated with cancer, at one time or another in their lifetime, they will develop a cardiovascular condition, which may or may not be related to the treatment that they receive. My <coughs> chapter deals with that. Chemotherapy can cause some side effects, right? And in, in terms of cardiovascular effects, it can affect the muscle, the heart muscle. It can affect your blood pressure. It can induce arrhythmia. It can do several things that are, you know, potential side effects of the medication. But we know which drugs can do that. So we are aware, we pay attention, we do testing to monitor for that. And in occasions, we give you different treatments to decrease the chances that this happens. Radiation therapy, again, now we have very targeted radiation that avoids some of the side effects, can also affect the cardiovascular system. It can affect your blood vessels, it can affect your valves. But because of that, we look at the short term of what happens immediately, and we also look at long-term survivors because some of these effects don't happen right away. It may happen years or decades into your life. The chapter goes through all that. It also talks a little bit at the end, this field, is now, it's a new field, at least in the cardiovascular relationship with cancer. It's called cardio-oncology. There's not even a board. There's only doctors that are interested in this field. In my case, I deal with weak hearts. I deal with broken hearts. And uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> my right here. Hey, hey. <laughs> not like her. <laughs> but, 
but uh, you know, part of those uh, effects from uh, chemotherapy <laughs> is that sometimes it leads to a weak heart. But again, there's hope, there's treatment, and there's a lot of information. And thank you very much for being here. Who knew this would be fun? And I guess that's the key, right? Yeah. Trying to somehow make it fun, finding a laugh somewhere along the way. Uh, well, right now, before we get to Dr. Yefis, I hope I said your name right. You did. I did? You did. <laughs> Wait till I get up here, Dr. Yefis. <laughs> <laughs> so keep that one. Uh, Dr. Alejandro Badia is going to speak next. He's a hand and upper extremity surgeon at uh, Badia Hand and Shoulder Center in Doral. Founding member of the American Hand Institute, a think tank and medical device startup company. It's focused on minimally invasive solutions in hand, wrist, and elbow pathology. And he's the worldwide president of the International Society for Sport Traumatology of the Hand. Lots of trauma with the hand, Dr. Badia. My cardiologist. <laughs> I can vouch for him. I'm standing here. This, this is a very serious subject. You might say, what, is, what does a hand surgeon have to do with the breast? <laughs> I decided after last week's events, I'm not even going to touch on that. <laughs> You'll be here all week, ladies and gentlemen. I, actually, hand surgery is, is kind of the red-headed stepchild of orthopedics. I bet a lot of people in the audience don't, don't realize there's such a discipline as hand surgery. Right? Just raise, raise your hand if you ever heard of a hand surgery. Or about one third. So, yeah. so, you know, it's funny. I get this question on, on you know, being a cocktail party. What, especially in Miami. Well, what is, what do you do as a hand surgery? You make the hand look better? You do like plastic surgery? I go, no, I, I'm actually the guy you go to when you put your hand in a circular saw and little things like that. So all of a sudden, but uh, actually if, if, you know, like cardiology, the hand and the upper limb actually is affected a great deal with this condition. And it's not just the disease itself, but more so uh, treatment. So obviously, even though radiation, you have really the best radiation oncologists anywhere. I actually, I actually send patients to her about elbow problems. That's another story. But I will tell you that um, occasionally there are problems with stiffness in the, in the shoulder, or there are compression neuropathies, meaning you've heard of carpal tunnel syndrome, right? But people think it's from a computer, which is another one of those, another one of those myths in medicine. But it's not from a computer. But there is uh, an increased incidence. In, uh, in, in women who are dealing with this because of uh, metabolic changes that occur with, with chemotherapy. So there are a lot of effects. Uh, lymphedema uh, is a dreaded complication. Uh, I will tell you, like many things in medicine, we manage them. We can't necessarily cure them, but you can manage them so well that, that you have no uh, significant ill effect. And there is a lot of myths. Uh, as a hand surgeon, I will tell you, women come to me and say, well, I, you know, I had a mastectomy. My, my doctor told me you can't put an IV in this arm or you can't do surgery. Well, I go, your wrist looks like this, and I'm going to put some steel in there, and you, and you need it. And I will tell you the complication rate is no different. So my chapter deals a lot with the myths surrounding the around your hand and upper limb, which I think all of you would agree is well, my microphone would fall if I didn't have that. Right? So there is a need for this. I do want to share, especially in the beginning with, with, with a lot of the heartfelt comments, that I'm just uh, finishing a book called Being Mortal. Has anybody read Being Mortal by Dr. Atul Gawande? I, I actually started reading it. Uh, Atul Gawande is a physician who was uh, spearheading the whole Amazon Health uh, initiative to try to really bring some sense to healthcare in this country. And um, I, was, uh, I had the pleasure of dropping off some materials at his office because we are, um, I'm also the founder of Ortho Now. Some of you may have heard of Ortho Now, which is an orthopedic walking center. So my team has said, let's contact Dr. Gawande and hopefully we'll get this up to uh, Jeff Bezos and, and people who can actually try to make an impact on how healthcare is delivered. And um, if you haven't read that book on being mortal, it's, it's not only about about dealing with potentially uh, life-threatening life diseases, but also the process of aging 
which all of us will go through. And uh, that's a book I highly, highly recommend. But uh, it's been an honor to be with this panel. And yes, the hand has something to do with the rest. <laughs> I didn't think about when he was talking about that was I was going to become the next George Costanza and become a hand model. <laughs> hand model, he was wearing mitts and everything else to not mess up his hands. So, all right, our final uh, participant on the panel before we get to your Q&A is Dr. Monica Yepes. She is an Amer associate professor of clinical radiology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine and a board certified radiologist who is fellowship trained in breast imaging at the combined Jackson Memorial University of Miami program, Dr. Yannis. Well, good evening, everyone. And again, as everyone has said, it's such an honor to be here and such a pleasure to have been included in this beautiful project by Cindy and Sabrina. It's very meaningful, especially because we kind of lose track of who we work for sometimes when we're in academic institutions and it's for you, it's for the women. And so bringing this information to you in a meaningful and understandable way is, is an important and, and extremely wonderful mission. So I guess it's only fitting that I'm the last person to speak tonight because I'm usually the first person that people with breast cancer encounter in their very long journey. So I'm usually, unfortunately, the person who brings the bad news. The bad news from there's something abnormal on your mammogram to you need a biopsy to unfortunately your biopsy results are showing that you do have breast cancer. So if there's anything that I would like for you to take away from tonight is early detection. And by the way, I preface my chapter in the book, it's very, it's becoming increasingly difficult to sift through the information that's coming through the media and the news daily telling you that breast imaging is not important, that early detection is not important, to wait until you're 50 to get your first mammogram, etc. So there's multiple, multiple evidence, incontrovertible evidence, since the 1990s demonstrating that early detection is key. And women who have mammograms and have early diagnosis of breast cancer do better. So that is kind of like the take home message tonight. The second thing is that, as everyone has mentioned, not all breast cancers are the same, not all women are the same, not all risk factors are the same. So I'm sure amongst the people that you know who have breast cancer, you know people who've never had a family history like your mom, to the people who have the BRCA mutations who are at extremely high risk. So just as treatment gets tailored to the person, the early detection and imaging is also tailored according to your risks. And that's why it's extremely important to be aware of your risks so that we know how to screen you in an appropriate manner so that we are the most effective and the best at diagnosing your breast cancer at an early stage. So that's kind of like the, the importance of the uh, uh, radiology and diagnostic part. Uh, the other issue is remember that you know sometimes when somebody was saying oh I know I have something abnormal I want to take it out you know I don't care I don't want to do a needle biopsy I don't want to do anything but remove whatever it is you, you tell me I have something abnormal I want a mastectomy straight from abnormal mammogram to mastectomy and no this is a process that has to be investigated and. Our mission, once we do see something abnormal, is to try to do the smallest biopsy possible to give the most amount of information. And sometimes in that process, when people are diagnosed with breast cancer, we have to do additional workup to make sure that you only have cancer in one site and that it's not in other areas in the breast or in the other breast, because all these things are gonna influence the type of treatment that you have, the type of surgery you have, the type of uh, 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 chemotherapy that you need, etc. So patience is also an important part of this process and going through all the steps as they should be done without running to the final to the final destiny which is surgery or oncology. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you. And um, I always like to, to end um, by first of all reminding everybody to have a mammogram or two, um, but I, I also like to thank my husband, who actually was the one that found my mother's uh, cancer up in here, in her in her neck, because her lymph nodes it was that badly spread. So I know I know sometimes I'm a little hard on you, and I know I never <laughs> I know I know I, I don't remind you all the time because I, I always like to forget, but 
I really would like to thank my husband, Alejandro Hernandez, Gano surgeon, for doing such a great job at saving my mom's life. Thank you. And then also, um, Barbie is representing. Barbie Pais is a super good friend of mine, big BFF. Um, is representing Republica and helped us um, with our wonderful name of Experts in Pink because her boss, <laughs> George Plasencia, when I was sharing to him about the book said, how about Experts in Pink? What a genius that guy is. <laughs> I just love him. I love him. So um, he, he's not here tonight, but please, Barbie, on behalf of Cindy and I, thank him because I think this name is going to put us on the map to help so many other people. And and we, we needed the marketing guidance because... <laughs> so you know what you're doing. And then Don't Sam, you. get up Sam. <laughs> Sam is a survivor. Uh, represent. Hi, everybody. I'm a 46 year survivor. I was diagnosed with cancer. It's in the book when I was in the Army a long time ago. Uh, thank you for having me here, Sydney. It's very important. You guys rock. You really rock. You doctors, especially the head doctor. <laughs> you rock. <laughs> and a couple of my friends out here. Thank you. Thank you very much. single survivor who's here today stands up because we want to clap for you and we want to give you another hundred years. that are not related to the cancer, a lot of people develop cardiovascular disease. And that is also a risk factor to develop cardiovascular disease related to chemo radiation therapy. But breast cancer itself, it doesn't. It's just the treatment that we give to, to curtail that. So it is the chemo. She, she was saying is the chemo a result of having cardiac issues. 
So the chemo no, and has no, no. Cause. Cause I cause the chemo cause cardiovascular. Right, I didn't have chemo radiation, but I did have to have open heart surgery. Yeah, radiation it's healthy. Yeah, yeah. Radiation itself can also accelerate coronary disease in chemotherapy like like we said it can induce weakening of the heart it can affect um, it can induce high blood pressure and it can even increase your chances to get a blood clot so so there's all that bad side of some of those medications but with good oncologies and looking at the potential that anybody could develop that I think the chances are also not you know they're lower than that people expect so you again, may have already had a little bit and it just accelerated yeah. it if you may have had that, like I said, you know, many of us without having any treatment develop coronary disease. Hi, first I have to say how absolutely incredible this event has been, mm -hmm. and uh, kudos to you two incredible women for putting this event together. Uh, I just uh, speechless, which is something I'm very rare. <laughs> But I have uh, not so much questions as a statement. I'm a 21-year breast cancer survivor. I survived a whole lot of other things, too. <laughs> but um, to uh, the lovely cardiologist, I have something to say. I had a stroke five years ago. And I've often wondered if it had anything to do with the fact that I had breast cancer. And uh, I may look sort of ditzy and alive, but I had a rough time. I was in a coma, and I really had a lot of problems. And then I was so delighted to hear that uh, you have a chapter in the book, so I can't wait to read it. Thank you, Cindy. You're awesome to include it. I think he's a cardiologist. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I have to thank you for something tonight. I have been searching for somebody that knows something about dental work. <laughs> <laughs> diagnosis because in your bosom buddies we've had a lot of members who've had dental problems and I've had 18 root canals. 18, we only have one, 32 teeth. <laughs> so, I mean, I cannot wait to buy, I'm going to buy everybody I know a copy. I have to get a little more off the screen or something. I think the book is just uh, incredible and I've read the other two. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I have to say something about you two wonderful radio broadcasters. I listen to your channel every morning. Thanks. And I, I listen because I think you're very informative and wonderful, but you play George Michael. Yeah! <laughs> very nice. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Later, but for now. Um, so this is for Cindy or Sabrina, whoever wants to answer it. Um, we hear so much about alternative treatments, particularly when it comes to cancers of all forms. Do you, in this book, or do you intend to address that? Um, alternative treatments, meaning herbal things, and just so many things that we hear. Luckily, never had to deal with them, but our brother did. Our brother who passed away from cancer. He did go through an alternative route, and so, you know, I just wanted to know if you guys intend to address that, or if you actually address it in the book. Thank you. Well, Thank you. I, after I was diagnosed, Sandy, with breast cancer, I did start eating more healthier than what I did before. And at first I thought it was my diet. I started blaming other things. My diet, or what did I do wrong? Uh, then I looked back on my family history, found out, oh, sorry, then found out that I have a strong family history. My mom's sister, my father's sister, uh, my, mom, my aunt had it, and then just recently my mother at 87 developed breast cancer. So with regard to your question, we don't have anything in this book, but the next book we will. Um, thank you. Uh, but I really, uh, with regard to holistic, I believe in it and I don't believe in it. I believe if you need treatment, you do need to get treatment and it's very important to get the treatment. But there are some people that prefer not to put any poison into their body and I respect that, but but it is, you know, holistic is kind of on a on the cuff for me, whether I agree or not. Some things I do, but if I need treatment to save my life, I think I'm gonna go with the treatment. Do any of the doctors on the yes. panel have anything to say about that before we go on? Excellent question, sister. Yeah, thank you. That's, Shouldn't she have known that's, that? That's a trend. That's a question. That is. What was the question to ask? <laughs> my my girlfriend's grimacing, knowing that I, I I tend to be very uh, 
straight up about this. I'd like to say that when we talk about these treatments, I really wish we would use the term adjunctive rather than an alternative. Because to me, what it alternative means is alternative to something that works. Okay? So, and that's fine. Believe me, I'm, I'm you know, in, in Ortho Now, we have the supplement line now called Ortho Nourish. You can get that online, and I think patients, you know, we, we, there's good literature about turmeric. We use uh, glucosamine and all these things, but they are adjunctive. And I, I'm glad that in three editions of the book, we haven't made that because there's plenty of books out there about that, but as allopathic physicians, I think we'd all agree that the things that we do, yes, there are side effects, but there are clinical studies. All right? We live in a society where you can't just give people anything, and, and so let's, let's not poo-poo these things. I think they're great, but you know, we kind of, you know, uh, Steve Jobs, you know, had, had his uh, perspective on, although he had a horrific cancer, so maybe he would die anyway, but you want to give, you know, 21st century medicine the best shot at survival. surgeon saying that another medical oncologist they told from the beginning that that's the answer but we do call them complementary or integrated medicine and we use that a lot we really appreciate all those supplements that are given in the right combination with the chemotherapies and they do help with the symptoms and we use all those things integratively and adjunctively but not alternatively and I think even if you're going to put that in the book it has to be like a big don't go for that. Just do it, you know, under guidance, under supervision, and do it right away because it does kill people. There are several articles about that. 200 fold increase in mortality when you use alternative treatments as opposed to conventional standard treatment. So, so safety you. first. Yes, right. safety right. first, absolutely. Yeah. The advances in regenerative medicine, have you guys seen any progress with uh, uh, treatments like stem cells and, uh, and natural killer cells? It's one of the oncologists. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of research. Uh, we do have now the personalized precision medicine approach. Uh, we are testing that usually in the advanced cancer stage or in multiple cancers, including hematology and medical oncology. Uh, the precision medicine is really trying to find the molecular pathways that are responsible for the tumor growth. It's really fascinating to really see that if you, I compare that with a moving car that comes towards you at fast speed, and I say if you only knew where the brake is, it would be so easy, and you wouldn't do a lot of damage, you would just be able to stop that from moving forward. And that's the precision medicine approach. And we have a lot of clinical trials that are looking now. There is a, there is a national trial, um, the National American Society of Clinical Oncology, which is the leading organization for oncology in the country, had partnered with a lot of uh, companies uh, trying to get those drugs that are approved for different cancer types. You get about Keytruda, immunotherapies, checkpoint inhibitors, vaccines. So they have approvals for one cancer here and there. But to know if that medication will work for a different kind of cancer, it's a very difficult study to do. And it's gonna, it's gonna take several years and a lot of money. So what the ASCO have done, and we are the only site in Florida that we offer that study at Sylvester, is really uh, taking those drugs and matching it with a mutation that is responsible theoretically for the tumor growth. And I have seen amazing responses. We have now for October campaign, we have those patients giving testimonies out there because they have failed everything that was approved for that cancer type and now on immunotherapy when nothing had worked, their chest had cleared up and from not being able to breathe on room and sitting down their back on the treadmill working out. So it's so it's so good to see these results happening. It's not common, it's not the norm, it's the exception, but that means we're on the right path and we're making progress. And I'm really I'm really happy to share those news with you. All right, I got time for two more questions. More questions. My question is for the hand doctor. <laughs> trigger fingers, is that normal? <coughs> or uh, you all, whatever, afterwards? Not they normal just like work. this and then... <laughs> uh, it's common, it's certainly common. Yeah. And it's not related. And I don't think there's been 
any, any relationship uh, between chemotherapy and what we call uh, tendinopathies, or what you have is called flexor stenosing tenosynovitis, which is, which is a long word, which basically is that the membrane around the flexor tendons that, that bends the fingers get thickened. And they're thickened in response to hormonal changes. So, don't grow in women, because I get, because men get stuff too, but it definitely is really related to estrogen. So perimenopausal women will suffer from trigger fingers and carpal tunnel syndrome, which is essentially the same thing as trigger finger, biological. It's just, it's a nerve compressed nerve. So, uh, the, oh, the, the treatment is, is, is very simple actually. It's a, it's a cortical steroid injection. We do it nowadays ultrasound guidance, very easy. And if it comes back quickly, the procedure, the surgery for it, is about five minutes long. And cures it. Yep, absolutely. Our last question right here. Last one. Um, I actually don't have a question. Um, Cindy, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for, for being who you are. I know we're back and forth, one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, giving each other support. And I'm grateful to God um, to have you in my life. So, Brina, I met you last year in a documentary. Um, it was a blessing also. I'm actually here because I've been thinking for eight weeks and this is where I know my, my, my Lord and Savior is real. How can I honor someone in my life and tell so many people what this person has done in my life? And this person is Dr. Calva. You know, I love you. <laughs> Never met you. I met you maybe, what, three, four months ago. I walked into your office <laughs> battling a demon of not loving myself and not loving who I saw in the mirror. And I was convinced that going flat, I never, never wanted reconstruction and it was Something that I dealt with on my own with God. I'm a woman of a lot of faith. My journey has been very difficult and you know it. But Lord, God do I, I'm so grateful for you. You gave my life such a turn. You made me see life differently. You, you gave me that that I, I didn't even know. I. I was lacking of, thanks to God first and to you. I love who I am today. Very nice. Can we just have a big round of applause for all of you?